this, the microphone is not on. Awesome. Um, it, is, it is on. That's weird. Okay. Much better. Okay. Um, I'm sure there is some, so I'll take questions on assignment three. None? No questions? Maybe I'll pull up the, uh... What was the bug? No, I did not. Huh? What was the, what was the bug with level two? There was no bug. <laughs> and why was it not working? Yeah, I thought you sent something out that said it was... I said it's working as intended. I made no changes. <laughs> huh? We actually asked, but there was no bug. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Asking you so, shows. Well, Wait, this if we're not quite sure. sure how we did something, and there's no way to replay it <laughs> because of the, the log off function, I mean, because you have to log off to know that you made it to the next group. Um, right. How? How do you want us to handle that in the readme? Yes? Yes, that's what you did. <laughs> um, no, I would not like that. Uh, we'll figure something out. Um, there's a way I can set it up where you're a member of all the other groups. Uh, yeah, I could look at it some more. But yeah, you should know how you broke something, right? I mean, you did it. So how did you do it? Well, the problem might have been related to that not getting feedback on the input necessarily. So I just maybe the way I approached the problem. Hmm. I wasn't okay. getting feedback on it, so when it happened, I had no idea that it happened. I had no feedback to know that it happened because of yeah. I think because of the piping and stuff. I don't know exactly why. Okay. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I remember what I did. I mean, all the different steps, sure, but have no idea which one was actually successful because I got no feedback when it happened. Uh, I see. And so I kept going and then happened to run score and see that I was like, okay. That you already broke it? Interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you know, so yeah, you can use the score definitely to tell you that you broke it, right? That'll tell you. Um, yeah, maybe I can give you access to the levels or back levels or something at some point. So that should be fine. Uh, cool. OK. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Okay, uh, GDB shows a segmentation fault for level one. Mm -hmm. GDB shows a segmentation fault for level one? Mm -hmm. That's weird. Actually, you said the same thing, right? Uh, that is strange. OK. so. Um, is it because you can't GDB and set to ID program? It should drop privileges. Uh, one thing you can do, if you have access to the binary, right, you can copy it from there to your local home directory. So you should be able to run GDB on it then, unless there's something wrong with the server. It could be because I changed the proc file system so that you only have access to your programs. Huh? If, if you can GDB part two? Yeah, I would say copy it. You can copy it either to your local folder. It should definitely work then. If it doesn't, then send me an email because mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I don't have any reason why it shouldn't work, but it's not like extra hard in that sense. It's not intended to be like that. Cool. Okay, so in case you didn't see it, I wrote out these are some tools uh, you should use. If you find other tools helpful, send them to me, and I will add them to this list. Um, so basically, right, the main idea is you need to first do some, you need to understand how the application works, right? So a very highly unaffected strategy will just be throwing all the techniques we talked about at, at the binary, right? Like trying to for overflows and command injections, all that stuff, because you don't know how the application actually works, right? So you need to understand how does this application work and then understand what could be the possible attacks to get it to do what you want to do uh, based on the attacks that we talked about in class. 
So there's pretty much two ways to go about doing this. So the first way is statically looking at the binary to see what it does, right? And so that would be using object dump or using one of the other disassemblers that we talked about in class in order to look at the binary, understand from the code what is it doing. Did anybody try that yet? How was it? Difficult? Because of the x86 code? Yeah, so it takes a little while to get kind of used to that. So, uh, you know, that's definitely one thing to do. Um, I think it's good just to look at it so you can kind of see what's going on. You can also see, usually from object dump, depending how the application is compiled, you can see what library functions it calls, so that could help tell you maybe what's vulnerable. Um, so what about, so why do you use GEB? So what's the other strategy? Why do you use GEB? So you want to, instead of like just looking at the program as instructions as itself, right? You want to actually understand how is this program executed, right? So with GDB, you can debug the program and then you can set breakpoints, you can um, see what it's doing, you can output the value of registers, uh, you can do all sorts of stuff. So can you just use GDB to break the program? No? Yes? Why? I think you can because you can set the value. Yes, yeah, so you can arbitrarily, once you're GDBing a program, you can arbitrarily change the values. Uh, so let's say you change the memory to make it do what you want to do. Is it going to work for this thing? No. No, that would be a huge security vulnerability if you could just debug a set UID program and then automatically get root privileges, right? Uh, so part of what, uh, when you can GDB a program? Oh, maybe that's why it crashes. Because yeah, I don't know. I gotta think. I gotta think about that. But uh, to debug a process, you're using the ptrace interface, and so the operating system, if it sees that you're trying to debug a set UID program, which in this case you are, it will drop those privileges, so it's executing as you, right? So in that way, it's um, you. Even if you break, you have full control over it. But at that point, it doesn't have the privileges that it normally. Okay, so GDB is definitely important. Uh, what are some other, any other tools that we've used so far? <coughs> yeah. Use strings. Strings. Ooh, great. Actually, that's a great um, tool. So what do strings do? Um, need to be print all the strings. Mm. Yeah. So actually, what it does, it's actually an incredibly simple tool. It just looks through. Not even a binary, just any data or any bytes, and it looks for ASCII sequences of at least, it's configurable, but it's at least four, and it will output all of those that it finds. So if you run the strings command on a program, like let's, let's see, I have no idea if this is going to work. functions, uh, mem copy, malloc, all kinds of stuff. And we can maybe even see, so, and then it, it has all of these Python symbols in there, which could be interesting. Um, so yeah, it's usually very nice. I mean, obviously Python is a huge program, right? So, but this is nice to see, you can see what strings are in the program, right? So you can know if you're interacting with it, have you seen all of the program? Are there some error codes that you're not seeing that could be interesting? Right, so this is part of kind of doing the static analysis to see, hey, can I actually, um, 
can I understand what this program is doing? And so strings is incredibly useful and really simple. What else? Any other tools? Object dump. Object dump? Yeah, so we may want to do I'm going to keep using Python, just so that there's no spoilers. Right? So as we saw, we can use object dump to, oops, uh, that's because I did not move to. Yeah. So I can look at the code here, right? See, does it have a main function? It's actually really interesting. I've never looked at, yeah, so see, even Python has a main function, right? So we can see that it's doing stuff. So yeah, we can look at actually the Python interpreter's code, so that can help to understand the control flow, see what else, what's running, what, what are some other things? Hex dump. What's that? Hex dump. Hex dump, ooh, uh, hex dump, what do you use hex dump for? It's just easier to look through the file with running over the string. Ah, uh, what did I do? trying to open blah, and we can see that 
the result from the program from Python is that there's no such file in directory. And then it's writing out to the console that, hey, I couldn't open this file. So what does this tell me about the program? What is it doing with my input? The first argument. I'm trying to see if there's a binary <laughs> called that and then trying to open it. Uh, yeah, not even a binary, a file. It's, it's, just, trying to, it's just trying to open this file that I gave on the parameter. So now I know that this program is going to open whatever parameter I pass in. So I can see here that the case that I tried is a file that doesn't exist. So what case should I try next? A file that does exist. A file that does exist, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's what I would try to do, right? To try to see more behavior of this program. Cool. So S trace is very awesome. S trace, S for system calls. What's the other um, tracing program? L trace. So what does L trace do? So ltrace is library calls. So ltrace will trace all the libc calls that your program makes. Right? So these aren't the calls that go into the kernel necessarily. These are at a higher level. So we can see, run it with ltrace to see what happens. Oh, hello. <laughs> see, sometimes they can be more or less or <laughs> um, there we go. Right? So as we'll see, every library call that it's making is being logged. And I wonder how large this file is going to be. I guess I can just kill it and see. Uh, so we see that it's actually read, reading environment variables in. Right? So it's actually kind of cool. We could see, already see that we can change, maybe alter the behavior of this program by changing these environment variables, which is something we couldn't see from S trace. But we can see it here in L trace because get end is a libc call. And we can see that it mallocs stuff, it uh, uses semaphores, it's, it's calculating string lengths, and it's copying strings around. Um, and we can see it's copying a lot of strings. Around, I think that's mostly what it's doing. Uh, I guess you can use L, L trace to filter out certain things about what it's going to trace or not trace. Um, wow, this is like a lot of. Well, it's trying to parse the file, trying to run it at the same time. But I gave it a file that doesn't exist. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's true. So this is, I don't even know what it's doing. It must be creating some. Temporary file, maybe. Yeah, something. Interesting. Or maybe it's reading something into something. Anybody do. Research on the Python interpreter? Not yet. Cool. Not yet? Cool. Uh, interesting. Oh, it is. Ah, so it's reading all the library files, like all of the Python library files. Interesting. Cool. See, we learned something new. All right, so with these tools, you can get very far because these let you see what the program is doing, right? And so from there, that can help you try to understand what's going on. Any other tools that people are using? All right. Brute force is cool. But using these, you should also try to understand and know, right, what you're what you're doing. So keep track of the things that you're trying for your readme. Okay. So we saw how uh, we saw how the stack works, and we saw how the stack changes when we make function calls. Right? And so stack overflows can occur when we're copying data, when data is copied without checking the boundaries of that data. Right? Because the programmer has to specify exactly how big chunks of memory are. Arrays are. So when we declare an array in C, we have to specify exactly how many bytes or the size of that array. And when we malloc data, we also have to specify exactly the size. And so the attacker can overflow. If the attacker controls what we're copying from, or controls the length or size of what we're copying, then they can force more data into, they can force larger data into a buffer that's a smaller size. Yeah. Okay. Um, so normally, right, normally if, so has anybody ever gotten like a second fault because they did something like this and they had a small buffer and no, nobody can actually raise a hand? Everybody's perfect in this room. 
so normally this causes a seg fall, right? So uh, kind of as a security person, a seg fault should uh, very highly focus your attention. Because usually, usually, depending on how the segmentation fault is happening, you can actually turn it into something, an attack, or it's usually indication of a vulnerability that you can use to exploit the program. Um, so if you, usually if you carefully craft this, the buffer that you're overflowing, it can, as we'll see in this example, you can uh, try to overwrite that return value on the stack, the save EIP, so that, that way, instead of that program going to where it was originally going to go to, right, the, the function that or the uh, function that called it, it's actually going to go to somewhere you control. And if you can control where the control flow of the application goes, you can make it execute your own code. Um, and so that's really this is more exploitation. Um, you can put this code that you're going to execute can be either part of the thing that you're overflowing or not. It can be somewhere else as long as you can get the control get control to that program. And this is why this is so important is this control. Now you're inside this process. You are executing your code of your choosing in this process. And so that code has the same privileges of that process. <coughs> so if it's a set UID program, right? You're going to have the privileges of that set UID. So, let's look at an example. So because of the CDECL calling convention, right, the save base pointer and the save EIP are both stored on the stack, right? So before we call a function, we save the EIP with the call instruction, and then the first thing that function does is save the base pointer and then set up a new base pointer. So those are both on the stack. So there's nothing in a program or a function, right? So EIP and EVP are saved on the stack. So can the program read and write to the stack? Yeah, this is where it puts it lo its local variables, right? It has to read and write to the stack, right? If it didn't read and write to the stack, then you could never use it, right? So there's nothing that prevents a program from changing those values. And so we'll see what happens if they do if uh, those values are changed. So let's look at an example. So we have our C program. We have a function called myCopy that takes in a character pointer. Uh, this function has a buffer foo, and we do a string copy from string to foo. So what's the semantics of string copy? Just move all the bytes from stir into the first argument. We mean all the bytes from stir. Stir is a so character pointer. It actually goes uh, character by character yeah, until character it encounters character. the delimiting character, which is slash zero. Yeah, copy. so it's take the first character that string points to, right? Copy that byte, or check it, if that byte's not null, do nothing, right? Copy that byte to the first byte of foo, and then increment both by one, right. and then keep doing that until foo points to a null byte. So did we tell string copy the size of the buffer foo? No, right? right? So if the attacker controls string, controls the size of string, can they make it this this copy be more than four bytes? Yes. Yeah. yeah, right? They can make it be however large they actually want to be. <laughs> and this is actually the key problem. So string copy is inherently dangerous because we don't tell it the size of foo. Right? String copy. Inside string copy, there's an act because in C, right, strings or buffers are just pointers to chunks of memory that have no length associated with them. So string copy has absolutely no way to tell what the size of this character pointer that gets passed in is. So it just stupidly copies from the source to the destination. Now, the other important thing about string copy is it puts a null byte at the end. May or may not be interesting. It's not right now, though. So then we look at a main function that calls this. So we're going to copy, so you can see I used this for my class last year. Note to self, never put in hard-coded class information into strings <laughs> in case you want to use this for other classes. And then we're going to print something else, and we're going to return 0. So pretty simple, right? So now let's 
see what happens when this program executes and how the stack looks based on this. So when we do object dump, we can see the code of this application, the x86 instructions, and main in its um, Apple, uh, prolog is going to first push EVP, then move the stack pointer to the base pointer, right? So it's going to save the caller's base pointer. It's going to create its own base pointer based on where the stack currently is. It's going to subtract ESP minus 10 or minus 16. Then it's going to move this 8048504 onto ESP, so at where ESP currently is, and it's going to call my copy. So what do we know about this 8048504? What is this? So is that? Well, that's not the string, it's uh, after. It's, are these ASCII values? 04 is an ASCII value? 04, 85, 04, 08? Oh, it's the address. It's the address, exactly. The string is good. Yes, this is the address of the constant bytes string ASU space, right? So the compiler, when it sees this constant string, it creates an else section for the, I think, I think it actually uses read-only memory for these constant strings. So it creates a read-only memory segment, and then it says in the ELF header, which we looked at, hey, this constant string is at this specific address. So I know in the code, I can reference this address with this hard-coded memory address. And it knows because it created the ELF file like this, that it can use that exact memory location. And the string will always be loaded there by the operating system. Cool. Then it's going to call my copy. Uh, then it's going to move 8048517 to EAX. Uh, it's going to move EAX into the stack pointer, and then it's going to call printf. So what's the second address? For the after. Yes, it's the string after, or the address of the string after. Yes. Cool. And then we're going to move 0 into EAX, call lead, and then call return. So what's this 0 into EAX doing? The return value, the return value. yeah, it's setting the return value of main. Cool. All right, so then let's look at my copy. So my copy, what's the first thing the program has to do? Yeah, it has to save, a new, save the base pointer. It's going to move the stack pointer to the base pointer. It's going to subtract hex 28 from the stack pointer. It's then going to move EDP plus 8 into EAX, then move EAX onto the stack plus 4. And then it's going to take EDP minus C, move that into EAX, and then move EAX onto the stack. So what's the stack layout going to look like? This is what you should be thinking about is, okay, when we call a string copy, what's the stack going to look like from these instructions? So what's the thing that's currently on the stack at the stack pointer? EAX, and then what was in EAX? Can trace back. So EAX is moved on the stack pointer. Then what's from EAX? So remember that the important thing about load effective address is even though it has the parentheses right, there's no D, uh, D reference here. So it takes the value in EDP. It subtracts hex C from it, so EVP minus C, then moves that into EAX. So from EVP, what do we know about this thing that is currently on the stack before we call string copy? It's length of the address. It's what? Length. It's no, address of my copy. It's the address of, ooh, the address of what? NYCPY. Uh, my copy? Uh, the address of my copy is going to be actually here where these bytes are stored. Right? The call is actually going to be the one that pushes the instruction pointer. Push from right to left. Right. 
So the topmost thing on the stack is going to be the rightmost. So we're going to push first the rightmost thing, which is string. And then we're going to push foo and then call. And so for reading from the bottom up, we go left to right. So we know that So what's on ESP is going to be the address, foo, right? The address of foo. And so what is foo? I mean, so, where is foo located on the stack? Minus 28 plus. Wait, say that? The hex 28 bytes below the stack pointer at the beginning? Uh, that will be the, the stack pointer. that'll be where, uh, it'll allocate that'll be it. where the address of foo is, but where is foo on the stack? What, what's, where's that value point to? Minus four. Say it again. Minus four. Minus four. Uh, minus twelve. Right. Yeah. C. Yeah. So EDP minus four. So this also helps us check. So at EDP, so if we go down from EDP, what are those variables? Are those are parameters. So let's think about before a function call in general from C, C, the C depot calling convention, right? So we push arguments, so arguments left to right, push, push, push. Mm -hmm. Then we call, which pushes the instruction pointer. And then the first thing we do is save the base pointer. And then why do we do that subtraction? Because we want We're making space for what? For the local variables of the function. So EDP is here. I see. Right? So what's a so below EVP is what? Local variables. So local variables, exactly. So that's why every time we see EVP minus something, we know that that's a local variable. And so when we see EVP plus something, what's that? Arguments. A parameter, exactly. And that's how you can read this, so you can know. So there's two tips that tell you that this is foo, that foo is located at EVP minus C. Mm -hmm. The first one is that um, it's being used here as the first parameter to string copy. So you can trace it back and say, okay, this must be foo because it's the first parameter to string copy. The other way is to say, okay, I know this is EVP minus something, and there's only one local variable in the function my copy, so this must be foo. And then, by a similar reason, what's EVP plus eight? STR. String, STR. Exactly, look at this. And then we leave and return, right, after we call string copy. It should be easy. So you actually already kind of figured out where everything is without even drawing the diagrams and stepping through it one by one to see how everything goes. Um, cool. But let's do it so we can see how it goes. Okay. So we have the only, uh, we have a bunch of registers, right? But the only registers used here are EAS, stack pointer, base pointer, and instruction pointer. We have all of our code here. Right, so the program can compile this and decide where to put it. And then we have our stack. And so let's say our stack, we start at FD2D4. And so that's what's in the stack pointer. And the base pointer is somewhere above that at FD2E0. And instruction pointer is currently at 804.48.40E, right, which is the start of the main function. So let's say we're going to simulate the execution here. So we're first going to save the caller of main's base pointer, right? So we're going to push EDP onto the stack. We're going to move the stack down, right? So we have the save base pointer. What's above that save base pointer? No, no. The parameters passed to main. There will be the parameters passed to main. He's going to be above it. What's directly above this EID? Or this, sorry, this, this base pointer. The, the a number of arguments. No. Higher. Yeah. What was it? Other programs. Other programs? Not quite. Like the the program that called me. Yes, the return, the save EIP, the return address into the program that called main. Right. Right. 
right? So that's main is not any different. It's just like every other program, right? So there's the main, there's, we know that when we get called, the thing on the stack, right at that moment, so right at that memory address, I can't read it now. F FD2D. That one, FD2D. Four. Four. Four, right? What's at that location, at that box that I didn't specify, is the address of the next instruction that we need to return to from whoever called main, right? And so at the end of this main function, what we call return, that's where we're gonna jump to, and that's where execution's gonna go to. And then, so we know, so that's the saved EIP from the last function, right? Now we got called, so our job is to save the base pointer of the last function, which we do. Then we set up our new base pointer for our frame, so we say the current stack pointer is now, the base pointer is currently our stack pointer where we are now, right? That sets up the base pointer. And then we make room for our local variable, so we're gonna move the stack pointer down, right? And from this way, from the base pointer, which points here, that's how we can get to arg C and all the arg V by going up. So those will be EVP plus at least eight, because we need, well, or, wait, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, four up there, yeah, so the EVP is here, right? So four above that will get us to the save instruction pointer, and four above that will get us to the first parameter, which will be arg c in main. And then four above that is going to be arg v. Yes. Exactly, cool. Okay, so we subtracted, we moved down the stack pointer, so now the stack pointer is going down here at fd2c0. Now we're gonna set up the stack for the function called to my copy, right? So we're gonna move that hex 804.8504 into the stack pointer, and then we're gonna call my copy. So what does the call my copy exactly going to do? Uh, put this return address, the address of the next line into the base pointer. Uh, the base pointer is pointed up at the top. Oh. Uh, stack stack point. Point. Right. Stack point. Sorry. Yes, so it's gonna, exactly. So it's going to push 8048423, right? That's the next instruction we want to execute onto the stack, and then what's going to happen? Eighty, mm, 
48504. I hate it when it's not like four, like it's an odd number. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so then we're going to move that value onto ESP plus four, right? So that's going to be the current stack pointer plus four. So that's going to be up here. And then we're going to do this load effective address. So we're going to calculate. Remember, load effective address does not dereference anything. Right, where this dereference, right, EVP plus eight, well, that's memory location FD2C0. We didn't move FD2C0 into EAX, right? We dereferenced that and we got whatever was at that value at that memory location, which was 8048504. Now we're going to calculate, take the address and take whatever's in base pointer. It doesn't actually matter that it's an address, right? Addresses are just values. Take FD2, wait, sorry, FD2B8, subtract C from it, subtract 12, and move that into EAX. So now EAX has the value FD2AC, which is there. Right? So at runtime, right, this address is going to change. I mean, different runs of this program, depending on the environment it's structured, right? That can change. The address of that constant string, 8048504, is never going to change. It's hard coded in the program. Right? But the stack can change, so this value, this is why it's essentially calculating the address of foo at runtime. Mm -hmm. right? So that buffer foo is located here, right? and it's only four bytes, so it's actually just this, the way I draw it, it's just these four here. So now we're going to move that value onto the stack pointer, right, to where the stack pointer currently is. And now we've set up our function frame so that we can call string copy. Hmm. So then what is string copy going to do? Same thing. We take the return address, put it in the stack pointer, and then we'll call the location where strcpy is located. Yes, OK, so actually it's. Uh, because of dynamic loading, it gets a little bit more complicated. It has to like look up and see, do I know, do I have a string copy function? Have I loaded it yet? If not, it will dynamically load it and then put it in an address um, in a, the correct place. So we won't go into that at all. But if we just treat the function string copy as a black box, right? what's it essentially going to do? Copy from here, right? Copy the byte at 804.8504. Copy that byte mm -hmm. to FD2AC, and then increment both by one. And so copy the byte at 804.8505. Copy that to FD2AB. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is getting too difficult. Uh, yeah. Right? Copy those bytes into there. And so then what's so? We know that at 804.8504 is are the contiguous bytes, right? At, exactly at this memory address is the byte A, which is actually will be ASCII A, which is what, 60, 61, I think? 65? 41 hex. 41 hex. 41. No, 41 is capital A. I think. Oh, yeah, capital A. Right? Doesn't matter. Please oh, yeah. look it up, right? But the point is, that is what's actually, those, that byte that is there is the ones and zeros that represent that integer, which when we interpret it as a character, we interpret it as the character A. Mm -hmm. And then one byte above that at 05 is going to be S, and then one byte above that is going to be U, and one byte above that is going to be space. All the way to the end, we'll get to the exclamation point, and then a zero, a null byte. Mm -hmm. And so when we do this copy, right? This is exactly what's going to happen. It's going to say, take that A, copy it at, at FD2AC, take that S, copy it at FD2AD, take the U, copy it all the way up. So what's actually going to happen is ASU is going to be copied here into foo, ASU space. Yes. And so this is where we get into Endian weirdness, right? So you see we copied 61, 73, 75, 20, mm -hmm. right? But when we interpret FD2AC as an integer, right, so we copied it 
this way, but when we interpret it as an integer, we interpret it the most significant bytes as the highest one, right? Exactly. So when we interpret this as a number, it's going to be hex 20, 75, 73, 61. So definitely have to keep that in mind when you're doing buffer overflows. And then we're going to copy CSE space, which is going to be the same thing, 63, 73, 65, 20. And then we're going to copy 340 space, which is 33, 34, 30, 20. Right? It just keeps doing this. Right? There's nothing to stop the program from doing this because string copy doesn't know the length of foo. Right. Right? It has absolutely no idea that it's copying over what was originally allocated to foo because it's just a pointer to some chunk of memory and we can increment pointers right, to get to the next element uh, of that array. So what's going to happen next? Exactly, it's going to write fall. Without right? this piece. <laughs> Huh? Without the space. Without no space, yeah. So it's going to be these ones. And then it's going to overwrite this, yeah. right? Space 201. Yep. And then it's going to write 5 space RO. And then CKS. And then what? The null byte, yeah. Oh, I didn't write the Okay, yes. Then the null byte, right? So does everything just. Crash, this happens, and then we get a, immediately a site fault after it copies this? No, not quite. No, why not? Because uh, it doesn't know what was a return address, and it's, it's just a set yeah, of just, memory. It's just address. data on the stack, right? Remember, we called it when our stack was located what, here, right? We called string copy here. So string copy made its own stack space where it does all its own stuff. And once it returns, it's going to put the stack back here. But we didn't mess with anything on here, right? We messed with essentially mains save things. So string copy just returns. And then now we get into, we could do anything else, right? We still have our base pointer points to where it should be. We still have our stack pointer points to where it should be, right? But now we have the leave instruction. So what does the leave instruction do? It loads back the EBP. Uh, yes, yeah, so move EBP into the stack pointer, and then pop EBP. Yep. So it does the opposite of these two instructions. So it's going to move the stack pointer, the base, yeah, the stack pointer to the base pointer. So the base pointer is at B8. So it's going to change the stack to be at B8. <coughs> And it's going to then, so the base pointer we can see is, wait, no, the stack pointer's up there, yeah, BC. Oh, 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 because then we pop. Yeah, so it moves it here, right? And so what was here at fall? The return value. The, return. the base pointer, the save base pointer is oh, yes, right yes. here. Right, right. This is this base pointer, right? Our base pointer currently points to the save base pointer at B8. So it moves the stack pointer to the base pointer, right. which is at B8, and it pops that value. It needs to pop that into EBP to restore the base pointer of main. Okay. So it, so now the base pointer is C6, 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 now we return, so what's going to happen? What does return do? Now the previous value over the stack pointer, that is what it is going to return to. Yeah, so right here at the stack pointer, right, it's going to say return means essentially pop into EIP. So take the value that's currently at the stack pointer, move that into the instruction pointer, and start executing from there. Right. Uh, that's why it's going to set the instruction pointer to be 31, 30, 32, 20. And then the program is going to go fetch and start executing from that kind of 31, 30, 32, 20. And that's where we get a segmentation fault and everything finally crashes. Because we, there is no memory mapped at 32, 30, 32, 20. What if there was memory mapped there? Yeah, it'll just start executing. It'll just interpret, fetch, execute, right? It's just executing memory. Uh, 
so we can actually, if we compile this, uh, we can run it and we'll see that it, it outputs a segmentation fault. Now, uh, you will need more flags if you want to try this on a newer GCC. This is on an older GCC. Uh, so this uh, doesn't have any of the stack canaries or any of the other detection things. But uh, you can do this and it works. Um, and this is a really key thing if you're trying to do these exploitations, right? To verify that you've done it. So getting a seg fault is one thing, right? But you want to know why did it seg fault? Right? Is it because you controlled the EIP? Is it because you controlled something else? It was another pointer dereference. Right? So what you really want to do is load the program in GDB, mm -hmm. run the program, and see where it crashes and why it crashes. So it's going to tell you to start the program. And then this is the key. It says segmentation fault 3130, 3220. I see. Where do these bytes come from? Well, OK, they're in the program. So yeah, let's cool. assume that it came from us, that we passed that string in. Right? That would be us. So that means we can control the instruction pointer 100%. So we can force this program to go wherever we want to go and execute whatever we want to execute. And so if we look at the registers, we can actually see that they're exactly what we calculated by hand running through it. So we can see that uh, you know, this, the base pointer was 60, 60, 61, 66, as we saw. So we were completely controlling the base pointer. And we're completely controlling the instruction pointer. You will have to disable the stack guard and uh, address randomization for this tool. Yeah. Uh, stack guard. You can still do this. Doesn't matter. Randomization doesn't matter because we didn't do any hard coded anything. Mm -hmm. Right? We're still causing it to crash. Okay. So these are the vulnerable functions that you should look at. These are the functions that, by themselves, are inherently vulnerable because. There's no way for the programmer to specify only copy this many bytes, mm -hmm. right? They're judged entirely on the size of the input, and so if the attacker can control the size of the input, they can always make it larger. Even this, so, so on that previous example, right, foo was only four bytes large, right? But even if foo was 1,000 bytes large, mm -hmm. or 10,000 bytes large, if we control what that, what's being copied there, we can always make it bigger, right? Because that 10,000 is constant, right? It doesn't depend on our input. So, and string copy has no way of knowing that it should only fill 10,000 bytes in there. So, gets is one of the functions. If you see this function, you should immediately be thinking buffer overflow. I mean, but you've got to think, how can I control the, the input to this? Uh, but it has a caveat, so you should always Always look at the documentation for these functions so you know exactly the semantics. For instance, for get, you can't have any new lines or end of files. Right? So that's actually really important when you're trying to create an exploit to know what characters can I use and what characters can't I use. Uh, as we saw, string copy, right? The same with string cat. Could catenate strings together. Uh, S printf. So this is a printf into a string. Right? And there's no way to specify the exact size there. Uh, same with BS printf. Uh, scanf, S scanf, and F scanf, <coughs> if you use the percent %s. Right? These are also vulnerable. Um, and any custom input routines as well. Right? So you can have a program that calls uh, get car to get a character. Right? If it keeps doing that and puts it into a buffer with no bounds checking, then you can control that. Right? So as long as you can control the input to these functions, Nine times out of ten, you can cause some kind of overflow. All right, that was awesome. Cool. So we'll stop here, and we're going to get into on Monday how to actually exploit a stack overflow vulnerability.